Um, thank you, Courtney and the Wayland Public Library for having us. And Vicki, thank you so much for coordinating this opportunity for the panel as well. Um, and good afternoon. Thank you all for coming to the Caregiver Journey Ups, Downs, Obstacles, and Resources panel today. Um, my name is Angela Crocker. Um, the, I'm the executive director of the Par, uh, the executive director of the Parmenter Foundation. Um, for those of you who may not know, the Parmenter Foundation is a nonprofit organization that provides hope and support for community members of all ages, focused on end of life and bereavement support. We offer valuable education programs and resources to provide guidance and comfort for the community. We also provide grants to network of nonprofit organizations and partners to further expand compassionate care and grief services throughout Metro West. And I am thrilled today to um, serve as the moderator on this very informative and engaging caregivers journey panel with three wonderful experts who I will introduce now. Um, the first person who will speak today is Ellie Ann Binder. She's the founder of Caregivers Wellbeing. And um, Ellie has always been inquisitive. She asks questions about the non-obvious in life. She's lived her life and has had multiple careers, which centered around asking the hard questions and working towards answering them. When she became the frontline caregiver for her husband, who was suffering from Alzheimer's, there were more questions for her than ever, and the answers were very hard to find. She experienced the loneliness and isolation of being a caregiver and started a consulting practice, which provides a safe place for caregivers to discuss their questions, find resources, and navigate through the difficult journey, which affects not just the health of the patient with dementia, but also can impact their caregiver dramatically. Next, we have Vicki Levine. She's the Director of Business Development at Ezra Home Care. Like Ellie, Vicki has worked in the home care industry, in her industry for many years, over eight years, and has, and has put it to practice herself. She has learned that home care services are essential to the overall wellness of family members and primary caregivers. She has been a part of incredible moments of care and empathy with many families. As the need for home care services increases in the future, Vicki hopes to be an educator and resource for her community and for families looking for compassionate non-medical care in their homes. And finally, we have Nikki Pugach, who is a licensed hospice social worker and a trustee on the Parmenter Foundation Board of Trustees. We are very fortunate to have her. She has a lifelong passion for end-of-life care and has worked in the field since 1993. She is currently a hospice social worker at the Good Shepherd Community Care, providing wonderful care to her patients and their families. She is a dedicated, knowledgeable, and kind resources. I am so excited to also announce that Nikki will be providing social worker consultation for individuals navigating end of life and bereavement issues and can offer invaluable support during what can become an incredibly challenging time, formalizing her volunteer role at the Parmenter Foundation and she can be reached at our offices uh, as needed. So each of our, just to let you know how today is going to run, each of our panelists will, will share with you the educational information they've had curated for you today. There'll be a slide presentation, and I'd also like to, um, I apologize, I'd like to welcome all of our Zoom uh, attendees as well. I really only welcome the people in, who are here. Um, so, uh, and then we'll open up the panel for general questions. So save your questions until the end, as Courtney mentioned, and our um, and and make those questions general questions that might benefit others. If you have a personal information or questions that you would like to have uh, answered, our panelists will stay after the event to speak to you more privately. And for those of you on Zoom, you are welcome to contact any of our panelists um, after the event. Um, as this is a hybrid event and with some participants on Zoom. Uh, we'll be very conscious of time, sticking to the one hour event time frame. And uh, as Courtney mentioned, she will curate all of the Zoom questions for the last uh, part of our meeting today. Um, and we appreciate your patience as this is our first hybrid uh, attempt uh, at this uh, this journey. So um, uh, my introduction was supposed to be five minutes. I see I've gone over already. Each <laughs> panelist will speak for about 12 minutes. And then there will be 15 minutes for questions following that. And so without further ado, shall we start, Ellie? Sure. Thank you, Angela. I'm very happy to be here today. 
please excuse my back, but I gotta see the screen. Um, we're gonna be speaking to you today about caregiving from several different vantage points. And so why are we speaking about caregiving? Well, I am a caregiver consultant and I've learned that caregiving has no boundaries. It could be applicable to dementia or to cancer, to a stroke victim, special needs child or an adult with an addiction problem or someone who has acute depression and so it goes on. So what exactly is caregiving? This is Webster's um, definition of caregiving. Relating to the activity or profession of regularly looking after a child or a sick elderly, sick elderly or disabled person. I would like to add to that definition. When your job becomes taking care of a loved one who can no longer take care of themselves and do the daily tasks of living, you're a caregiver. What exactly, I'm going to concentrate today on dementia, but I want to make sure that you understand I respect and honor all kinds of caregiving and consult with people who are doing all kinds of caregiving. So um, what exactly is dementia? I'm going to focus on that. Um, dementia, as you may, I'm sure many of you know, and I suspect I'm speaking to an audience of people who know a lot, maybe even a lot more than I do, but let's just go with it. Dementia, as many of you know, is an umbrella term for many kinds of memory diseases. So it's often um, a problem that is not spoken about, but, and that we're not prepared for. Here are some facts about dementia and especially Alzheimer's. By the way, I've put an umbrella, we'll come back to this slide. Those are three things, three of the, the most um, prominent dementia illnesses. I want to give you some statistics. In 2019, the number of people living with Alzheimer's who could not take care of activities such as personal care, cooking, eating, or taking their medicine needed care. The cases of dementia in the United States is estimated to be at 5.8 million, with the majority of people being age 65 or older. About 10%, this is the kind of the dull part, but important to know, about 10% of the totally elderly population is estimated to suffer from dementia. And in a nationally representative study of cognitive impairment prevalence, almost 10% of those as I just said, um, are ages 65 or older, while another 22% have what's called mild cognitive impairment. I would like to just go off script for one second and say that mild cognitive impairment is step one on the dementia list. And if you are told your loved one as I was, had mild cognitive impairment, which I didn't know what it was, by the way. Um, that's just a warning that you're starting, you need to start to think about other things as they come along. Um, as Angela said, when my husband was sick, got sick, it, I was presented with um, many questions and not many answers. Now, I will say to you that it was 12 or 15 years ago, and we've come much further today. But nevertheless, when you need to find common sense answers and good, reputable resources to take care of your loved one, I had to set out and find them because they weren't around. Um, I want to say to you all also that the goal of my remarks today is to 
hopefully have you walk away with one or two helpful things that you haven't heard before. Um, because I found that all information was helpful and I kept it in a big notebook, <laughs> um, which I still recommend to all my clients. Big notebook, tabs. Okay, I'm off script again. Slide. <laughs> um, but I say that to you because, you know, it's impossible to remember everything. It's impossible. Um, only thing that I will say to you is make sure that all of the information you're getting from doctors, neurologists, and so forth, and is usually valid. But watch out for the Facebook stuff. Make sure that the information you get on Facebook is medically grounded and truth scientifically truthful. That means it's gone through clinical trials and so forth and so on. Okay, what is caregiving? I have already had Webster's um, definition up there. So who are who are the caregivers? Well, could be any one of us, couldn't it? Um, how do you know when you're a caregiver? I'll just tell you a very fast story. My, I have two adult daughters who started about a year before I even caught on to what they were saying. Mom, dad's not doing well. Mom, dad's forgetting this. Mom, something's wrong. And I was very busy with my career and I just, okay, he's forgotten he's 80. Well, could that be dementia? Well, guess what? It was. So what is dementia? Let's look at this slide for a second. And um, you can see that I've listed three, the three most common Alzheimer's being with absolutely the one that's universally diagnosed. Um, I'll give you just a couple of things. Um, vascular dementia is the result of the loss of blood to the brain because of strokes or blood clots. And Lewy body is um, only about 5 or 10% of the population are diagnosed. Here's a couple of other th terms you may have heard. Frontotemporal dementia. Mixed dementia. Got to be the worst of all. And, of course, Parkinson's. There is Parkinson's dementia. Okay. What are the most obvious signs of dementia? Mom's having trouble following her favorite TV program. Maybe your loved one is not sleeping well. Or conversely, as my husband did, sleeping most of the day. Uh, or perhaps you're, you're, I found this to be quite upsetting. My husband forgot how to tie his shoes. And I couldn't understand that at all until someone explained to me that tying are patterns so when you tie if you forget how to do the patterns you can't tie your shoes luckily that's not a problem anymore because sneakers come with velcro <laughs> thank goodness and then of course there's the financial side someone who is sliding into memory issues got to be very careful and make sure you take over and i mean that sincerely take over the finances, because you could be in a lot of trouble. Um, so because Alzheimer's is a slowly developing disease, I would always recommend that you get a get your PCP to give you a, um, a recommendation to a neurological testing. And there are specialized cl clinics who do that. So now, how do you know, how did you know that you had to become a caregiver? Well, I've discussed it sometimes in the um, There's very um, small signs, and you don't know if you're 65, 75, 80-year-old husband or father or mother or family loved one are just depressed because they know something isn't quite right. Um, as I, as I look back, I realize now 
that I became a caregiver, but I hadn't known it yet, long before I knew it. And so, can you prepare to become a caregiver? I have a two letter word for the answer to that. And it is no, <laughs> no. However, as I said, you can observe, you can get neurological testing. So you know what you're starting to deal with. You can have, watch for um, behavior changes get some um, medication for the depression. Depression always comes along with this, always. Not a doctor, but I'm telling you, depression, de depression comes along. Um, as I told you, how am I doing for time? Do I have one more minute? Yeah, you have, you have a couple more minutes. Right okay, there. good. As I told you, I take care of caregivers, and frankly, not a lot of other people are doing that, which means I don't deal with the patient. I deal with the person in charge of the patient. And one of the most shocking statistics I've come up with is that 50% of dementia caregivers pass away before the patient. And why is that? Anybody who's taking care of a dementia patient knows stress. the answer. Stress, the stress. And so, um it's a it's a long and difficult journey and it takes it takes um it it feeds on your your body and your your well-being i'm still trying to get my blood pressure back to where it was and my husband is gone five years so i'm just I have a big list of things you should do if you're a caregiver. I'll tell you about it after I'm finished. Because I will now close <laughs> with four takeaways. For those of you who are caregivers, number one, make sure you have all your financial and money reviewed by a financial planner and an elder care doctor, a uh, lawyer. Make sure you have a durable power of attorney, a health care proxy, and an updated will uh, uh, will with your wishes and your loved ones. And don't wait until, don't wait. Don't go in back to them and say, I, what do you think you'd like? Do it now when they can still with, with good common sense. Um, and you know, I say that for the obvious reasons. If you're driving in a car with your lover and you get in a car accident and you can't make decisions and at that moment, it's got to be covered legally. Um, may, God bless you. Pardon me. My father always told me when you sneeze on something, it's the truth. So thank you. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. I would be sneezing all throughout if that the case. Um, number two. Make organizational plans and have an understanding of the various things you have to do. Bring your house up to date so your your loved one is safe. Um, if you have to downsize or have to move into an apartment or, or assisted living, make those plans in advance. Think about them. Uh, prepare to make practical medical decisions. And number four, Understand your emotional expectations for your loved one. They, they, the patient, are not the same as they were before. And so they may not be capable of making decisions that you always made together. Um, surround yourself with a village of people, friends and family, and make your plans. Because remember, as a caregiver, you have a very difficult job. I know, I've been there. And there's no off button. So please don't look for one, but please take care of yourselves. Oh, there's another page. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a good page. <laughs> I'll do it. I'm running one, one minute over. Okay, go for it. Thank you. Well, what I wanted to really say to all of you is that it's okay 
to feel sad. It's okay to feel frustrated and angry. And please don't feel guilty if you feel that way. I had very many instances where, not very many, a few, where people sort of made me feel guilty that I was angry. And I would only accept that from someone who's walking where I'm walking. So keep saying to yourself, I am doing the best I can. It's not his or her or their fault. It's the illness. Just keep saying, it's the illness. Thank you. Thank you, Ellie. That was great. Thanks. And now, um, Vicki is going to talk with us about aging in place and home care. Thank you, Vicki. Thank you. First, I wanted to say thank you to everybody that's here in attendance and to all of our Zoom watchers. Hello, and thank you for being um, connected. Um, for those that don't know me, I am Vicki Levine. I'm the Business Development Director for Ezra Home Care, which is a non-medical, private pay home care agency. And I'll define that a little bit more in a couple moments. But today we're talking about the caregiver's journey. And I wanted just to tell you right up front, I've been on that journey. <laughs> I've been a primary caregiver. Um, I've watched amazing opportunities where people take care of loved ones in their home. And I used to own a home care agency. So I understand this a little bit more than some. And I've got a lot of information to share, but I promise no quizzes today. Right. So let's talk about aging in place. Aging in place is being in your own place, your own space, your own home, your own environment. You maintain a sense of independence there. You stay connected to your community there. When you know where you are, when you know your environment, it's safe. And that's what aging in place is all about. So aging in place can happen when you're 35, 65, 105. What's interesting to me is actually what's coming up in our world. Um, by 2030, one in every five American will be over the age of 65. And that's a pretty amazing stat to me because I am on that road. <laughs> Um, so let's talk about non-medical home care and what you should be looking for if that's the road that you need to go down. Um, non-medical home care provides caregivers that assist those who need help with their activities of daily living. And that's probably one of my favorite terms, ADLs, activities of daily living. And we take for granted a lot of those, such as buttoning a shirt putting on your socks, remember to take your AM meds. I mean, we just, it's a rote kind of thing and we just do it. And when you can't do it, it's a problem. <laughs> so you need to find a home care agency that's going to help with those. That's probably your first question. So what is included when you make that initial call to a home care agency? You know, what can they do for you? This is a list of all of the things that they can possibly help with. Some do everything, some do only a few, but these are the biggies that every day your loved one may need help with. You want that first phone call to be the connecting phone call. You want to be able to count on the agency. You want to be able to count on your caregiver that comes. You want consistency. And I think that that's probably one of the biggest things that you need to ask for. Will my caregiver be the same person? You don't want a revolving door of caregivers coming in. Consistency is key. Consistency is key when you're 10 and when you're 80. It's consistency. It's important to know who are you going to talk to in the home care agency. Know what the protocol is so that you, when you have a question, you have the right contact and you're not waiting. Um, the individual connection that a caregiver has with their um, client, and in the non-medical home care agency, we call our patients their clients because it's non-medical. The connection is really important. If your loved one is not connecting with their caregiver, 
and you know do give it a little bit of time it's not magical it doesn't happen right away but if you're about a week or two into services and it's not a good match ask um the matches are really really important you want a caregiver who understands alzheimer's you want a caregiver that understands cognitive impairment you don't necessarily want <laughs> Bless you. See, mm -hmm. sorry. <laughs> you want somebody who has got a bit of experience under their caregiving belt. So get direct answers and get the transparency when you make the first phone calls to your home care agency. So now the question is, how am I going to pay for home care? Okay. Aging in place, I'll be very honest, is not inexpensive. Um, you have to make that decision as you're doing your estate planning, as you're thinking ahead, and that's always the key. Staying at home may be the way to go. Um, private home care is a little bit more, um, but there are other options. I'll just say that you can look at your own medical insurance. Many um, plans do cover for that, but it's limited. So that's all that I really wanna get into right now about that. but. It may be better to stay at home than necessarily move. It just depends on everybody's financial situation. Um, there are a lot of benefits when it comes to home care. Like I've mentioned, comfort and familiarity, independence and autonomy. Never do you want a caregiver to take away the independence of your loved one if they can still do it. I give the best, or well, I think I think it's the best example. If your loved one really enjoys being in the kitchen and making meatloaf, let them do it. The caregiver's there to assist. The caregiver can help bring down the breadcrumbs, bring down the eggs. But if your loved one, if that's their thing, and if that's what means the most to them, let them do it. But with the help of the caregiver so that we don't forget to turn off the stove. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. <laughs> um, this relationship that cultivates within home care is very special. and. When your family knows the caregiver and your loved one knows the caregiver, you've increased your family. We, as caregivers, do make a significant difference in people's lives. And not only do we help your loved one, but we also support your family. In this age, many people don't live in the same states as their families or as their parents. Um, we're the care agencies <laughs> are here to support the entire family, as well as um, the person who needs the, the assistance and the support. Um, home care agencies can be a lot of things to a lot of people. We're also an incredible resource. Like Ellie mentioned, elder care attorneys, financial advisors, caregiver consultants, <laughs> um, geriatric care managers, we're home care agencies are a resource much like Parmentor is an incredible resource um it's the people that we come in contact with so we um try to help guide and help you answer the questions there's a lot of questions and believe it or not we also know the best place to get chocolate milkshakes i'm just saying it's just an <laughs> extra but we work closely with your families and we as home care agencies help to create a nurturing and supportive environment uh, the caregivers should be employees. They shouldn't be 1099s. Matches, like I mentioned, from the caregiver to the client are really crucial. So do ask. Don't be afraid to shake a little bit, um, you know, shake the tree, so to speak. Um, you, you want to have a really nice relationship between your caregiver and your loved one. And you want integrity right away. Transparency is key. And um, first, and, and then, you know, obviously the well being of your loved one is the utmost priority. So when you're making the calls and talking to home care agencies, those are the things that you want to make sure. It was a brief presentation. There's a lot of questions with home care, but, um, you know, like Angela mentioned, happy to stay afterward, happy to take any questions from my Zoom audience. And, um, you know, just really appreciate the opportunity to be an educator about home care agencies. So thank you for your time. Thank you so much. And our final presenter today is Nikki Pugach, um, and she'll be talking about 
um, more end of life hospice and grief uh, components here today. So welcome again. Thank you for being here. Um, my topic is sometimes the one that's most feared. Um, and my goal for my entire career has been to demystify a little bit and to make end of life care, um, the very end of life care, a part of the life cycle. So what is hospice care? Hospice is an additional layer of care that comes to the patient wherever they live. That could be home, an assisted living facility, or a skilled nursing facility. Um, so we go to where you are. Um, it can also be in a hospital, depending on um, how ill the patient is. So we can even bring it to a hospital. Who determines the eligibility for hospice care? It's determined by the patient's physician and the hospice care team in consultation with the patient and his or her family. So you may meet two people with the diagnosis of dementia. What will determine their eligibility for hospice is how far along the trajectory they are. Someone in the early stages of dementia would probably not qualify for hospice care. Someone in the latter stages would. And again, um, it takes two physicians to certify that this person is eligible for hospice. And what does hospice care include? It's a primary team that each person will get that's admitted that consists of a nurse, a social worker, a chaplain, a home health care aide, and a volunteer. Um, it's kind of like a menu. You don't have to accept all of these things, especially initially, but during the time that you're a hospice patient, things may change and you may want something halfway down the road that you didn't want initially, and we can make that happen. We also cover any, necess any necessary, um, what we call DME, durable medical equipment, um, hospital bed, over the bed table, uh, wheelchair, um, commode, um, diapers, uh, wipes, um, any of the medications that are related to the hospice diagnosis, we will cover. If someone is taking medications that are unrelated to their hospice diagnosis, they continue to get those as they were prior to the admission to hospice. And the nurse will help determine that. And sometimes when a nurse, when you meet your primary nurse, he or she will go through your um, medications and may make recommendations that I think that one's not necessary anymore. Um, I think maybe this one will help. They're constantly looking at a patient's symptoms and what medications might help. Um, our, if there's one primary goal that hospice have, it has its symptom management, and we want someone to be as comfortable as they can be, um, uh, and that includes physical and emotional pain. So how does one pay for hospice care? Hospice care comes under the Medicare umbrella. Medicare is the organization that sets the rules and guidelines that as a hospice agency, we have to adhere to. And they change all the time and we're always alerted to what might be changing. But anyone who has Medicare will have their, if they are admitted to hospice will be covered. And fortunately today, um, versus many years ago, most private insurances also cover home care. And at least with Good Shepherd and many other hospices as well, if a patient has no insurance, um, we can provide um, free care. Um, that's particularly true of nonprofit hospices. There are both for profit hospices and nonprofit. Good Shepherd is a nonprofit hospice. So a person has come onto hospice. Um, we never, the question we're most often act, asked by the family is how long is this person gonna live? And we don't get a crystal ball. Um, people could have similar symptoms and live longer or shorter. Everybody has their own trajectory towards when they're gonna die. A nurse will always keep the family posted as to the signs and symptoms they're seeing and that can help the family reassure them. But 
um, one of the most difficult places for, I think, for a family to be is when they know what the end result is, they can't change it, and they're just kind of waiting for that to happen. So that's where the emotional support comes in. And we are there to support the family, mostly to listen, share experiences that might be helpful, um, and help a family work through any particular issues that they might have. It might be a family that's been estranged from family members for a long time. All of a sudden, they're facing the death of a loved one, and they want to mend some of those fences. Um, our social worker will help to try to do that. If there are other community resources that are needed, a social worker can help a family access those. So if your family, if your loved one has died, um, I think grief in our culture is enormously misunderstood. Um, it is uh, something people will often ask, so when is my grief going to end? And my response is usually, it won't end, but it will change over time. As time goes on, um, your grief becomes integrated into your life. And as time moves on, your grief will take a different place. But I don't think it ever ends. Um, and I think it's important for people to know that so they're not waiting for the end. Um, hospice and many other community organizations offer bereavement services. Part of the hospice benefit is that we provide bereavement support for a year after someone dies. We have our own bereavement department and the support can come in the form of routine mailings at sequential times after your, first, after your loved one has died and letting the family know, you know, it's been so many weeks or months. This is what you might be feeling. Um, don't you know, don't feel it's not normal because there's nothing really that's not considered normal when it comes to grief. Again, it's different for every person. Um, it can come in the form of one-on-one -on -one, um, visits, uh, phone calls. Um, if we need that a family member needs further services, then we can offer, we can help connect you with a therapist or um, something that we might not offer, but we will never leave a family um, without a good plan of care. Um, so as I said, all feelings are normal. Um, I think one of the hardest things to do is trust yourself. You may at times feel like you're going crazy um, and that's normal to feel, but chances are it's a normal part of grief. Um, so try to ride with it. Remind yourself you're not going crazy and that this is normal. Along with the sadness and sometimes the anger and um, a, lot, a lot of other feelings, don't be surprised if you feel some relief. You've been a caregiver, chances are, for a fair amount of time, and there can don't feel guilty if you feel relief that your loved one has died and that you no longer have to provide that care. Um, along with that comes... Um, can also come a sense of emptiness because that piece of what you were doing that filled a good portion of your day is no longer there. And then the wonder, the wondering is, what do I do with myself now? You know, I don't have to do A, B, or C anymore. My loved one's not here. What do I do? And that's, again, going to be a different answer for everybody. So... How can I possibly go on with that feeling of emptiness and all the sadness and anger and whatever else I'm feeling? One recommendation is to take it one day at a time. Try not to look too far ahead into the future. If one day you accomplish doing something nice for yourself, whatever that is, like going out for a walk, taking a bubble bath, having a phone call with a friend that you know is a trusted friend, one day at a time. Um, I always recommend, if you can, trying to do something that will take even 10 or 15 minutes each day that reminds your body that you're taking care of it, like some of the things I've mentioned. Um, acknowledge progress as you move along that, you know, I didn't cry as much today. 
or um, I was able to spend more than 15 minutes doing something nice for myself. Um, and as over time, a new normal is going to evolve for you. Even though you may think you're stuck in that initial phase of grief, a new normal is going to evolve, evolve but it's hard. It's hard and it's painful. Um, so never underestimate the importance of time. As I said earlier, there are no limits on grief. Um, so don't, you know, don't expect it to end. Um, it can be a different journey for each person. Um, I always suggest not to rush into major life changes, especially that first year. You may be tempted to move. You may be tempted to um, make big changes. Um, but because so much can change during that first year, I always recommend, you know, certainly you can, my recommendation is not to. Um, but if you feel like a big change is, you really want to make a big change, try to talk to somebody about it and maybe just get another perspective on it before you make the change. Because um, what you feel today can look very different than three months from now and six months and going forward. How do you find support in friends and family? Um, you may experience that um, many friends that you thought could be there withdraw. They don't know what to do. Again, grief is very underestimated in, in our culture, more so than in other cultures. Um, I think the most important thing is if you can tell your friends that can be there for you, it's not so much about what you say, but be there with me. Um, just be able to listen to me without judgment. Um, people who are more anxious about grief may tend to want to give you recommendations and this is what you should be doing. And that's not often the most helpful thing to do. Um, uh, and you will find other resources and others who can um, who can help you. And again, I mentioned some of those um, bereavement with a trained counselor, bereavement support groups, online or in person. And if you live a distance from where your hospice was, um, um, hospice is a reciprocal thing. So that if you had a loved one die in Boston and you happen to live in another state, you can find the closest hospice to you in your other state let them know that you had a loved one die in Massachusetts. Could they connect you with a hospice in your area? And they can connect you with bereavement services and there will be no charge for those. That's one of the better benefits I think that hospice can provide. Um, almost finished. Um, a reminder that I learned a long time ago from a colleague is that grief can be physically exhausting as well as emotionally exhausting. I recommend you let your primary care physician know if they don't already about the loss that you've had so that they can support you if you're going through physical issues. Try to get good rest, and that's not always easy. Um, try to get good hydration and exercise. Um, and um, even if you feel like you can't eat, stay as well hydrated as you can. That's a gift to your body. Being dehydrated can be very painful. Allow yourself to cry and don't worry if you don't. Again, it's different for every person. Um, I think crying is a cathartic thing. And I think we were given the gift of being able to do that because it is cathartic. And generally, as painful as it can be to have a crying session, you'll feel better afterwards. Um, if you have young children, I always suggest don't hide your grief from your children. You're being a good role model. You're helping them to know it's okay to share their grief with you. And sharing grief as a family can be a very consoling and wonderful thing to do. And kids are much more resilient than we think they are. And um, so don't be afraid to grieve with your children. And along with everyone else, I'll be here afterwards to answer any specific questions. And thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.
Great. So um, do we have anyone here in our audience that has any questions about what you've learned today or, or generally about kind of like our bereavement concerns? We know uh, it's been a lot of information. <laughs> I will. Um, my name is Sora. Uh, I've come from uh, Comfort Care, Home Health Care Services. Um, the question is, uh, Nikki, for you when you're saying it's so with your your presentation was kind of a playbook on what to do when that happens. Um, is, is it a generic or is it more because in the earlier when um, when Ellie was saying that there are more women who are supporting. So I'm, I'm talking from my sense. <laughs> um, so if so it, or is it the same playbook which applies for both men and women? I would say so. I think as a culture, again, Women tend to be more the caregivers, but um, I've seen plenty of wonderful male care caregivers as well. And yes, I would say the same principles apply in terms of, of what to do. I would just add that um, sometimes, please take this as I'm going to put it out to you. Sometimes men don't talk as much about their feelings as women do. And um, so it's a bit of a challenge to get get those feelings from I have found that it's a little bit of a challenge to get the feelings from men who will tend to say, I'm doing fine, I'm good, I'm fine, don't worry about me, I'm fine. Well, caregiving is universal. Just remember I told you that. Caregiving is universal. And so we all feel different things, but the expression and bringing together friends to help you with it is really important. Did I answer your question? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll just add, if I can, a little bit that in the home care business, I think it's again, it's the the client is the most important person and the focus, but there's the family. And there's a lot of questions and sometimes they're just, there is dysfunction. I know it's oh. shocking. I know, I know. <laughs> but a home care agency is there to sort of look at the whole picture. And it's not the home care agency's job to be the social worker, but yet we as the home care agency can answer a lot of questions. And I think being open to that and having that kind of partnership with the agency that you decide to work with is important so that everybody has the opportunity. There's no dumb question. Right. Um, every question is a good question. And it it is also in this journey as well. There is no dumb question. But sometimes there are dumb people who ask you dumb <laughs> questions. I'm sorry, I know you were all thinking. Sometimes people say things to, to you like, how are you doing, Ellie? Well, it's, this is previous. And I wanted to say, well, do you want the truth mm -hmm. or do you want the homogenized version? <laughs> and I learned to say, I'm fine if I didn't if I understood the person asking me the question, didn't really care, was just kind of like, I'm going to ask you the question and I'm hoping I don't have to ask you another question after that. So not everybody is as careful as they should be. They're asking for the sake of it. They're asking because they're in the room with you and they don't know what else to say. Yeah. Well, also say we had a wonderful event with Colin Campbell last year. And one of the things I learned from him, he has a, a really fabulous book about a grief. And it's one of the first ones that kind of illustrate as a griever, how you can put others, your friends and community at ease. And he really created this kind of playbook or script that he would tell his friends and families because he didn't want to become isolated in his grief. And he would say, you know, he had lost his um, children in a tragic accident. And so he just said, you know, we love to say their names. We love to talk about them. Please share stories with it. And I may cry and that's okay. And, but, you know, he really set the, the tone so that people would feel welcome to, to grieve with him and to share with he and his wife. So 
for what that might be worth as well. I felt that that was a very telling um, instruction for us where we, we don't know what to say, they don't know what to say. Um, we also have on our website a what to say, what not to say guidance, which I think for, is a good uh, 101 help yeah. for people yes. um, because it can be very awkward with the cultural. Is, is there a website to link there for this? Um, our, ish, our website is www.parmenterfoundation.org. There are materials in the back that have um, the website plastered all over them. So um, please definitely come to, to visit us. Thank you. We have another question, I think. Yes. Um, you were talking about the connection with home care workers, and I'm wondering if, um, what about um, people who don't want home care workers to come in even though it's needed? Um, so I was wondering what your experience with that has been. Sure. So um, the, the question basically is, what if the family doesn't want a caregiver coming well, in? Is what, there a, it's a medical concern? What if the person who needs care doesn't <laughs> want oh, someone oh, to I see. Okay. Okay. Client client doesn't want someone to come in? The client doesn't like it. Yeah. That, that's a great question. I mean, it's a tricky and, answer. <laughs> <laughs> it it is. Um, there's a. I think that having conversation with the home care agency and the client, um, be it over the phone, over Zoom, face to face, is helpful. Um, usually, when a client is in a situation and they're very resistant, they're certainly not going to listen to their spouse. They are definitely not going to listen to their son or daughter. Um, it, it's hard. My recommendation, you know, um, just having been in the industry is to start slow. You don't have to go all in, dabble your feet a little bit in the water. Um, you never know. You might just hit it right that the match with the caregiver is on point and that there's really good care coming in. It, it, it's a tricky situation. Um, and sometimes... It's not a winnable situation. Sometimes people will just not allow anyone to come into their house. And sometimes um, if the patient won't accept it, the, the suggestion coming from the family, mm -hmm. a doctor can intervene. And sometimes patients are more apt to listen to their doctor. If the doctor says, you know, my recommendation is, and I, I think you should try this. So sometimes they have more, more clout on the family. Is it also sometimes um, helpful to say um, that the home care is uh, is the help for the caregiver yes. as well, so that it's not the client doesn't feel yep. like they are being mm -hmm. burdensome, but that they're, it's actually a, a help mm -hmm. for their loved one? Absolutely. Yeah it's, a, yeah, it's a great point, and, yeah. and definitely. But it depends on whether your client is the patient or the family, and the family may be in charge what, wanting that, and the patient gets very stubborn and says, no, not nobody is coming into my house. So it's tricky. It, I, it, it, it is it's, tricky. It's I think what's some um, juggling situation. But I think the most important thing is that there shouldn't be a lot of pressure. There should yeah. be no pressure, actually, from the home care agency trying to take charge or for the loved one of the client to be pushy it all happens when it's right um but if then you've got to watch out for safety issues well of course i mean there's so many factors yeah. but i think you know speaking broadly from a home care perspective that you don't want to be with an agency that's pushy and just doing it to do it you want the transparency, you want the communication, and you want the authenticity from the home care agency. Um, Absolutely. They will understand. So um, I'm just curious, you know, my sense is with the home care workers is that there's a lot more demand for them than supply currently. Probably has always been that way, but it seems like it's acute. And um, my sense is also that workers can work for multiple agencies. Is that right? 
That's um, correct. And um, I'll repeat the question. Just like, go ahead. Yeah, and I was wondering if you could just talk about the current kind of current situation and the best is the best thing to deal with multiple agencies or, you know, what's the best way to work in this difficult environment? Sure. So the question basically is about the um, the volume of caregivers. Uh, CNAs, HHAs, so we have certified nursing assistants, you have home health aides. Um, since COVID, honestly, it's been a difficult staff to, um, to retain. So again, when talking with your home care agency, that's a great question to ask, to ask about their staff. What kind of qualifications do they have? How long have the caregivers been with you on average? Um, you know, I think people that that train to be HHAs or CNAs are doing an amazing um, job in the world. We need them, um, but there's definitely um, the market is 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 tough right now. So again, being with an agency, asking the agency about their caregivers is really the key thing to do. Um, there, they are out there, and there are quality caregivers out there. Um, it's just connecting. In regards to um, asking about working with multiple agencies at one time, that's a personal preference, really. Um, you know, I, I have my own opinion about that, but if that works for the family and they get the quality caregivers and they get the transparency and they get the honesty from both agencies and the both agencies are working well for one another, all for it. Mickey, to add on to that question, could you share some um, some suggestions on how to vet a home care agency? Are there a few questions that would tell you that this is a home care agency that is going to be able to follow through and provide care for your family? Um, sure. Um, thanks. Um, in regards to the questions that you want to ask, maybe like, you know, if you will, the, the top three questions that you want to ask, you want to understand what the agreement is. Am I, am I locked in for the rest of my life? Am I, what are the, the, the constraints in the, in the client service agreement? Um, talk about the terms, talk about how do I cancel if I don't like the services or, something wrong happens, ask about that. That's really important. Um, and again, you wanna know about the training of your of the caregivers. And I think asking the question, are they employees of the agency or are they 1099s? Are they contractors? I think that those are the three big questions. Can you explain that I the difference between? Oh, sure. Um, so a 1099, you know, just doing my taxes. <laughs> um, 1099s are consultants, basically. So they're almost like being a freelance caregiver. So they're per diem. They're not on the payroll. Uh, I mean, sorry, they, they are on the payroll, but um, they're not full-time employees or part-time. They're not employees. I think that's the difference. It's freelance and employees. Um, with employees, you have to be vetted. You have to have your quarry run. You have to have your background check, your driver's license check if they're going to be transporting your loved one to and around, um, and, and references. An agency that does those kind of vetting processes, an agency that has employees versus 1099s would be my suggestion if you had a choice between agencies. Thank you. Mm -hmm. There's a question in the back. What is the current hourly rate, like an average, and are there a minimum amount of hours that a family needs to hire uh, home helpers? Um, so, well, that can okay. vary. Yeah, um, exactly. Well, it's this is simply this area, Metro West. Let's in the Metro West area, I think it does vary from agency to agency. Again, it's make and it's an unfortunate process of having to make a lot of calls because you're not going to get it's not one solid protocol for for all of us. It happens to be that in Massachusetts, just as a quick FYI, um, home non medical home care agencies are not licensed. So therefore, 
there's no mandated expected minimum shift. Some agencies will do one hour as a minimum. Some do six hours as a minimum. Um, it's different for every agency. It's a, it's a lot of footwork, but when you hit that right one, you'll know. And in regards to rate, again, it, it will fluctuate. But for your agency, what is the rate and what do you uh, specify? Sure. Hours? Um, well, for our agency, every case is looked at individually. Um, for us at Ezra Home Care, a minimum shift is six hours. We can do less, but getting the quality caregiver is just as important to us as the care of the client. So I can say that our caregivers like to work longer hours and they're quality caregivers. And that's the um, symbiotic relationship between a good agency with great caregivers. I will also add that um, um, there are agencies and then there are private caregivers that work um, on their own. Um, I, I think in today's culture, because we, there's less accessibility to home health aides, as we said earlier, um, um, a lot of caregivers have um, lowered their um, time expectations, where they once said, no, I need to work a six to eight hour shift. They're more willing to work less hours um, because, uh, you know, because sometimes people don't want six or eight hours. Um, networking, um, is a great way to go to find private caregivers <laughs> to put your nope. agency down. But, you know, talking to friends um, and what you might not get with a private caregiver is if the caregiver can't be there one day, there's not someone to replace them with an agency. You're generally going to get um, some, you know, part of what they their service they offer is that they they'll have someone there if your caregiver can't be there. Um, long-term care contracts um, that a lot of people have will often pay for um, at least three quarters of the cost uh, of it, of what it is. Um, and I will say that um, private, one of the difference between an agency and a private caregiver, an agency will usually charge a certain amount of money. The agency gets part of the money and the caregiver gets part of the money. If you hire a private aid, they generally get the whole fee. Thank you. But, just, but if I can, but, sorry, but, uh, but hey, hey, I'm, I'm going to just, if I can, yeah, not to, to jump all over that, <laughs> Go right but, ahead. but with an agency um, and the vetting that they do typically for, or that they, uh, not even typically, that they, that, that is done for the caregiver, the Corey report, knowing who's coming into your home, knowing that you can feel confident that a, a security background, a, you know, Corey background check has been done is important. But then from the agency side, you're paying for liability insurance, you're paying for workman's comp insurance. If a private caregiver were to hurt themselves in your home, then a case could be brought to you and your family, your estate. Um, so there are, there, there, there are, are some pros. protections. Yeah, yes. there's, there's, you pay a little bit more with an agency. Um, margins are not, you know, extreme. I don't think that agencies are making hand over fist money, but what they are doing is they're providing a service that is needed and that is safe. It is insured and, um, monitored. And that's absolutely. And true. I would just want to add to be very careful if you you pick someone because they're going to charge you less. Just be careful. As I've heard all ask, kinds of stories, and still ask the same questions. If yeah. you know, if someone recommends a private caregiver, ask the same questions. And what if get you references? Yeah, really good, solid references. Not their aunt who lives in <laughs> two states away. I've I've so, heard some pretty uncomfortable stories about. We need to see if we get yes. Oh, oh sorry, yeah, I don't mean to interrupt. I was just wondering if um, Nikki could talk about where all the different places that hospice takes place. Um, you know, in home, in the hospital, in a center, and 
in my experience, we had in-home for a loved one and, and hospice visiting, but I was kind of shocked that people weren't there all the time. Yeah, so, <laughs> I think the biggest misconception when someone signs on to hospice is that we're going to move in 24-7. And we don't move in. Um, again, like everything else, Medicare has modified and modified and modified how much we can, how much time we can offer. So no, we don't move into your house 24 seven, but we have nursing access 24 seven. So if, if a new problem arises at two o'clock in the morning, there's a nurse waiting for your call. That nurse will try to walk you through um, what's going on. Whenever someone's admitted, we put certain, um, what we call a comfort kit of medication into the patient's home. And the nurse might say, give a dose of this or give a dose of that. If the problem cannot be resolved, a nurse will come out in the middle of the night. So um, it's kind of the yin and the yang. Mm -hmm. We don't move in, but we're accessible to you. Was the question more about where you can receive? Well, hospice. that's another part of and, it. Yeah. And I think that you talked about this in your presentation that hospice is not just at home, right. that there are many places that you can receive hospice care from hospice agencies. Um, we have two hospice agencies that really serve most of the Metro West area, Care Dimensions and um, Good Shepherd. And so where can you receive hospice if you are in a nursing home? Can you can receive it there? There's no place you can't receive hospice. Wherever the patient is. Wherever the patient is, is where we go. Mm -hmm. And not to confuse the issue, but there are some levels of hospice care. So when we take care, we might... At, um, take care of someone in the hospital and um, it, we would do that if the patient's symptoms could not be managed at home and it's called G GIP general inpatient level of care so that if that is needed hospice will be paying for that hospitalization we also can do respite care so um uh, patients, um, if the family needs some respite, can go to a facility that we connect with and have up to five days of respite every benefit period where the patient can go there, the family can get a break. If a patient wants to travel to their home in the Berkshires, we can um, do a hospice transfer so that they don't lose hospice care, but they have it accessible to them there. And finally, if a patient remains at home, Symptoms cannot be covered, but uh, can be taken care of by the family. There's family break, caregiver breakdown. We can put in something that's called continuous care for a certain amount of time, mm -hmm. whereas we can put in round the clock care. Once the symptoms are under control, we have to take it out. Mm -hmm. So, and I, I can <laughs> also just add that some home care agencies do partner. Yes. With hospice, yes, to provide either the twenty four seven yep. or a caregiver right. through the day as it's well. It's usually half nurse partner and half aid. And I think everybody knows that hospice no longer is just end of life. In other words, palliative. There's sorry, go ahead. It, palliative. It's um, it used to be fifty years ago that hospice would come in what when the patient was at the very end of life. That's not true anymore. That is correct. We encourage people to at least be um, um, evaluated for admission sooner rather than later. Um, there are There is palliative care and hospice care. Right. Um, the major difference is palliative care, you get many less services. You don't get all the services of hospice. You get a nursing visit once a month. Mm -hmm. You don't get the 24-hour access. Um, but if you have palliative care, you continue to you can continue to have um, aggressive uh, treatment for whatever your illness is. On hospice, generally, you cannot um, have that, but you'll get a lot more services. And hospice runs in benefit periods. So the first two benefit periods are each 90 days. At the end of the 90 days, your nurse will evaluate you, make sure you still qualify, you stay on for another 90 days. And after that, there are unlimited 60-day benefit periods. So we've had people on for a couple of years. And often with the care they're getting from hospice, they get better 
care, the better quality of life and live longer. So it's no longer, you have to die in a certain amount of time. <laughs> Ellie, um, your agency, uh, you know, exactly. I mean, if I called upon you for help, how would you, what, what would you offer? I, what would I offer? Yes. Um, well, first of all, I'm an independent consultant, so yep. I offer vetted resources. But mostly what I offer is someone, let's see, how can I say this? Mm -hmm. um, I offer you the opportunity to talk, vet your feelings, ask your questions. Whatever is going on in your head, we can talk about. I also work with corporations, just by the way, where I run groups for um, employees. And um, so I do private as well as corporate. Um, most of my clients call me, I, I say they call me when they're ready to pull their hair out and they don't want to talk to their family at that moment. They want to talk to someone who's been on the journey and has good common sense. And I'm a great listener. <laughs> I could probably make that condensed so <laughs> another question. Where where do geriatric care managers fit in and what exactly do they do? Um my sense at second hand is uh because my sister called a few of them and um and her impression was that they wouldn't even talk to her without being um, hired to do kind of a full plan. So not even initial consultations. So that's kind of a two part question. One is where do they fit into the landscape? And two, is that generally the way they work that you can't have an initial consultation to see if there's a fit there. You basically have to sign on for you know, a plan for at least a thousand, if not more dollars. To that um, so. I, Jerry asked, can Jerry, you restate the question for the Zoom listeners? Oh, it's okay. I typed it in the chat. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, I would say that geriatric care workers have more of a medical side that they take care of. And sometimes they're, if they're, sometimes they do the, emotional side but not that's not their their expertise and i worked with the geriatric caregiver so i'm speaking to you from experience um they will um recommend uh play uh, a rehab center for example my husband was in and out of the hospital many times and Anytime he came out, he had to go to rehab because he had to catch up with what he lost in the hospital. All right. They, my geriatric care give worker, who worked for an agency, by the way, um, would recommend three different places or one different. And then she'd make the calls that would say they can take him today or they can take him this afternoon. Um, that's different than what I was explaining to you, I do. I would recommend to a geriatric caregiver, this isn't what I do, this is what they will do for you and your patient. So if, if I can just add just a little bit. Now, I'm a non-medical home care agency. Geriatric care managers, um, and they have a new new name now, now oh. they're aging life consultants. So there's another- Every three weeks. Well, they they rebranded themselves, but they're aging life consultants. And like Ellie said, yes, they tend to have um, medical backgrounds. Um, or social workers. Or social workers, right. Um, they're more of an advocate for you and your family than they don't provide care they can make recommendations, but they are actually more of an advocate and um, a resource. So you you would be hiring a geriatric care manager, aging life consultant um, for their services. Um, in regards to consultations, I can't speak to that. Again, it's um, making the recommendations to do your research, 
talk with friends. Um, did you want to maybe pipe in? And actually, we have somebody here who's from. Um, I'm, um, I'm not only a caregiver for a mother who has dementia and colon cancer, um, but also a geriatric care manager in Framingham with a nonprofit. So um, we uh, do an initial consultation. We see if it's a good fit. Um, then um, the family or the spouse decides if they would like to hire us. Mm -hmm. um, and then we go into the home, interview the client, mm -hmm. um, and kind of develop a care plan. So what does a family need? What kind of services? And like Ellie mentioned, plug you into the system. So if you need home care, we would contact Ezra and see how many hours or some other home care agencies. Right. Or if the caregiver needs uh, specialized support, we would reach out to Ellie. We would kind of be the coordinator of all the services needed mm -hmm. because it can be very challenging. And now also working with hospice, um, not only professionally, but also personally, um, it is a challenge mm -hmm. just to coordinate all the aspects of it. Mm -hmm. and so it's almost like a coach mm -hmm. um, that comes in, kind of identifies what the family needs, what the client needs, what are the preferences, and then works with the family mm -hmm. and the client. So um, it seems like some people are... Um, are are compensated with commissions by facilities if they place if they place somebody in there? We don't have that. So those okay. are some other um, those organizations. Are not, okay. um, those are not geriatric care managers. Not necessarily. So okay. there are some agencies that um, kind of yeah. work with different facilities and are based on commission. They probably provide a free service, then they provide you a laundry list of um, the, the facilities, and um, we actually do go in and do the vetting. We talk to people. Right. We're kind of in the field, so we kind of know. Um, we determine what the client, what is kind of, uh, what would be a good fit in terms of, let's say, assisted living, what do they like, what the family likes, what are the financial resources, mm -hmm. um, and kind of combine a plan mm -hmm. moving forward. Let's so, talk excuse me, I'm there going to um, let all the conversation continue to happen in the room, but I feel like we might want to let our Zoom audience go since they probably oh. can't be uh, taking advantage in hearing what you all are discussing. So um, thank you all who have joined us from uh, Zoom land, and we are pleased to have um, been able to have the opportunity to educate you. And if you have questions, we're all available to chat with you. Um, give us a call. Our information. Um, has been provided on several slides. And uh, I believe you may be receiving the slideshow. So thank you so much.